I am Zero, and this is my Twitch. Zero does stuff, because Zero does stuff. And a lot of that is RPG-related stuff, and sometimes RPG-adjacent stuff. But my guest today is the lovely, wonderful Susanna. And I'll leave it up to Susanna to, to kind of introduce herself and provide her credits, you know, what, what, what she does in the RPG space and, and out of it. Take it away, please, Susanna. A variety of things in the RPG space and, and out of it. But uh, yeah, so I am, the main thing I do is that I am the, uh, the head of the Thornvale podcast. It's an actual play Monster of the Week podcast following uh, three monster hunters as they try to protect a small town off the coast of Florida, a little island. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of fun. Uh, I also have a book series that is uh, set in the same universe uh, in a different part of the United States. And I also make dice, which I've got a few over here I could like show you. Let's see, oh, let's I find a dice. About the dice. I should have set up a little <laughs> chat command for a link for all that. This has money in it. Oh. Little shredded bits of money. Unable to Just tell. the one I've got on hand right now. <laughs> yeah. So... I can give you a little link if you need one, but yeah. So Yeah, yeah, sure. Just feel free to drop it in the um in the Twitch chat there since you're in there. Sure, <laughs> I can do that. Dixon says the books are really good, and I love my MH dice, Monster, Monster Hour dice that you made. Oh yeah, that's how I... I did. Yeah. There, I'll post the link for the dice. Excellent, excellent. Uh, a woman of many talents, and um, I've also posted yes, I can, in fact, the this. link to the books and to Thornvale, so people can. I have to verify my account. That's rude. Oh, well, sorry. That's that's me to try and cut down the 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 bots. Or I the, don't. Yeah, no, I don't later say that. But yeah. Okay. So I understand Thornvale is based on the books. So obviously yep. the books came first. Sort of. So, sort of. You want to elaborate on that one? <laughs> okay, so technically speaking, the books came first. So I wrote the first three books, that's uh, the first three novellas that are in this book mm -hmm. first, and then started Thornville a couple of months later. But books take forever to like finish up and like get them ready and whatnot. So technically, Thornvale came out May of 2019, and the book came out October of 2019. <laughs> but the book was conceived of first, or... Yes, oh, yes, the books were okay. conceived of like a couple of years before the show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. But the uh, they actually came out a couple of months after the show. Yep, uh, I actually have a writing background as well. Um, um, and I will not be sharing my pen names uh, because that's my past. I haven't decided yet if I'm going back to it. My husband would like me to because it brings in some money. Um, <laughs> money is nice. But yeah, so I totally understand the 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 cycle of the writing, the drafting, the proofreading, the editing, and the getting it all ready to go onto Amazon and everything. And but I've not done print, so that's the only thing I don't understand the cycle of. But I do know the pain and how long it takes to to get it all done, which is why um, I love RPGs. There's so much more immediate feedback and reaction. But totally. What made you decide to start the podcast? Okay, so this is what I've told a few times, but um basically I started getting into podcasting um or podcasts in general uh when I moved off campus from my college and my roommates were obsessed with uh Welcome to Night Vale. And so that was my first podcast. And then when I got a little bored with that, because I get bored with everything, regardless of how good it is, mm -hmm. um, I started asking around. It's like, hey, can someone recommend me some other podcast in this like girls group that was in my college? And someone said, hey, you should check out The Adventure Zone, which is like um, a couple of guys playing D&D &D with their dad. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. I didn't know anything about D&D &D or anything like that. And so I started listening to that. And I really enjoyed it. And then um, I started getting into actually playing when I got married to my husband. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me all about his Pathfinder games that he used to play. And he was telling me like, how he missed them so much. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I could figure out this DMing thing. I'm a writer. I can do that, right? And so I started DMing Pathfinder first. 
And then um, I wanted to introduce him to this podcast that I listened to. And so we started listening to The Adventure Zone. And then eventually we listened to Amnesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a terrible time for my nose to start itching. (laughs) Um, And we started listening. That was their Monster of the Week show. And I started listening to that. And I was listening to it and like under and like absorbing the rules. And I was like, oh, you know what? I could totally use my Dragon Knights world from my Deep Hollow books to make another show, like a whole new show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was how Thornvale came to exist. And I reached out to Wesley, who I knew from college, and he was in my writing group, and I knew he had a wonderful voice. And so I was like, hey, do you want to join my show? You have a great voice. And he was Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I know nothing about playing RPGs, but why not? Mm -hmm. And then I reached out on Facebook, um, and I was like, you know, and I press ganged my husband into doing it. (laughs) <laughs> he, he didn't mind um and i reached out on facebook and said you know I'd, i i've got this show that i'm starting is anyone interested in in doing it with me and i had been chatting with hannah who i also knew from college mm-hmm. for a little while um and she was like i would like to and i was like yes because she was exactly the person that i had hoped would be interested in but i didn't want to like actually reach out and ask her because <laughs> we hadn't known each other like super well like we're really good friends now but like before we were just kind of like we didn't really know each other super well. We'd only really been like interacting on Facebook and stuff. So yeah. that was how the show came to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I always love hearing how the, the podcasts get started. So you only vaguely knew some of the people. That's, that's great. Well, I knew them all. Um, I wasn't a big friend uh, of Hannah. I knew Wesley really well, and I knew my husband, obviously pretty well um (laughs) but uh i had been sort of i had been kind of friends with hannah um before she was in one of my uh cinematic arts classes i'm a cinematic arts minor she was a cinematic arts major um and so we had met then and i had vaguely remembered her from that time period because i that same semester i hit my head really hard on the ground and lost all the memory from the year before. So <gasps> I, I, I kind of half forgot her, but I met her later on and she was friends with another friend of mine and we kind of started and, but after college, we kind of interacted a bunch on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were kind of like starting to become better friends. And then obviously now that we've started the show, we've become really, really good friends. So, but yeah, so that was, that was how it happened. But I, I knew everyone. And then, they didn't know each other. I think Andrew and Wesley had met because yeah. Andrew had come to one of my like writing club meetings when he was visiting me in college. Because mm-hmm. he's a couple years older than me, so he would just come visit from around where we live when, you know, every once in a while. The more that you talk, the more I'm like totally relating because when I first started playing d and I bought the, the group together because they were all people I knew. They m- were not really, a, they might be some of them might have been aware of each other. But, yeah, I brought people together from my writing background, from my real-life friends to my um, online friends as well. So, it, it, yeah, wow. I say, hey, guys, we're just totally getting along here. This is fun. I'm just going to get that out of the way. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So... I kind of want to talk a little bit more about Thornvale, but I also know that we've been touting this as the the best ever advice, that, writing advice that you've ever received. So I'll put it to the audience what they would like to hear first. We will eventually get to the topic if you would like us to talk a little bit more about Thornvale. But if you want us to go straight to the best writing advice that she's ever received... Um, we'll do that. Uh, the Real Potus ninety eight, who just subscribed, uh, thank you for that. Real Potus says, oh. says that forming a group is like making friends. Hey, I like you. Now we're gonna play together. Please sit down. <laughs> yeah, basically. By the way, I don't know why, but I can't verify my, I can't verify myself on Twitch. Like it's not letting me verify my phone number. I don't know why. I sent you the link if you wanted to post it yourself oh, okay. for yep. my dice. So, so yeah okay uh just let you know it, it won't let me i don't know why i'll try to do it on my phone i haven't, I haven't thought about that but yeah it did it won't no, it won't I, let me cool. 
I will share and the link with everyone in the chat. There, there you go. So which is dragon. But yeah, it's ba com. getting together with a group is just kind of like just like, hey, you. I bet you'd be fun in this context. Would you like to come join? And and I will. I will start you on a multi-year experience. <laughs> Yeah, it is a multi-year experience, isn't it? Um, just you because know, I know a lot of people have experience with um playing tabletop RPGs, and they're like, "Oh, we have issues with scheduling," or "Oh, you know, groups just fall apart constantly." Now, I know mm -hmm. my personal experience has been that most of the tabletop RPGs I've been in have actually gone on for years. What has your experience been like? Which one camp are you been in? Uh, well, it depends. I have my, like, home game. We have a dragon. Uh, the original game that we're playing, Pathfinder, I'm still playing. It's been going on for, like, five years now. Wow. Um, we meet every once in a while whenever we can, you know. But it used to be kind of like a, let's try to do it weekly. And now we're like, a, let's try to do it <laughs> once every couple of weeks, if possible. Because we're all really busy people. Mm. Um, but yeah, so we still get together. We just had a game yesterday, so. Awesome. Um, that was a lot of fun. So yeah, we're still getting together. It's you know scheduling issues are are complicated when you and you're not. It's not something that like you're really like committed to, and you have a bunch of people who aren't like this is not like the thing that they really want to do. We don't have a we don't have much problems with with Thornvale. Like we we have a night that we usually record on. If we need to record a little extra, we'll we'll record on another night. The hardest thing was Wesley's um schedule has always been kind of weird. Mm. <laughs> it's been like he tends to work nights which is when we need to record so it's very inconvenient but oh. his schedule's a little bit better now yeah. um yeah but he used to work like nights at walmart and it was very very unhelpful for our recording schedule um his schedule's a little less difficult now but uh yeah he still always had off on like thursdays and so we just record on thursdays and if ever once in a while we need to record a little more we'll try to find a spot where we can record and but most stuff kind of gets moved around whenever we need to record, you know, so we record a lot. We have to record a lot, too, because we're a bit behind right now because people keep getting sick or otherwise indisposed. No, I mean, as um, Dixon just said, scheduling sucks because life happens, trademark. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you also record on American Thursday because Rick Adam Wolf also records on American Thursday. Uh, I found Thursday's a fairly common one. A lot of the people we, we've had like come in and do uh, one shots with us will take up one of our Thursdays and do a couple of hours of recording and then we were supposed to have one this Thursday but someone had a medical procedure come up all of a sudden and we're like, ah, inconvenient timing. <laughs> so we're recording our next one shot this Thursday. Awesome, awesome. But yeah, it's we have had, um, we've been really, really good. We've released once a week for our entire run, except for one day. One, there was one day, we, the only time we've ever missed a week, there was one day we missed a week, and it was because literally the entire cast had COVID. <laughs> well, and I none of us were excuse. were well enough to to edit an episode. <laughs> understood. Understood. No, I, I think yeah. we can we can get a pass every so often. I say as I haven't I think released so. anything in quite a few weeks now. Whoops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what what are the differences between the Deep Hollow books and the Thorn Thornvale seating? Uh, the difference is location mainly. So Thornvale is set in on on a little island off the coast of Florida. Um, it's technically two little islands, but it's like one town. They're like little islands right next to each other, and they have a little ferry that goes back and forth. Um, and then DiPaolo is set in Vermont. So it's just kind of different little locations. I set them originally because, like I said, DiPaolo came first. So I had it originally in Vermont because I kind of liked the sort of uh, sort of mountainy vibes, and it's a state where there aren't like a lot of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. No offense if you live in Vermont. I, I don't like places where there are lots of people, so it's actually a compliment for me. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted that kind of like a uh, small town northern vibe. Um, and then when we started Thornvale, I was like, I want to be as far away from 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 Deep Hollow as possible because I don't want to have these characters run into each other. <laughs> uh, so why Florida though? I like Florida. 
Huh. It's kind of it's kind of like um, there's like people joke about it being like the Australia of the United States. So it's just like everything there wants to kill you. It's the place I... with alligators and black bears and invasive snakes and and crazy people. So yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think Florida's cool. I like I like visiting Florida. We had a big trip um, a year ago. Uh, my husband and I went down to Florida for a week, and it was really nice. So yeah, I I love that uh, that people are like, oh, it's the it's the Australia of America, but Americans seem to really like Australians. So oh, we we do like Australia. Yeah, we we think Australia is cool. It's just that like everything there wants to murder you, and it's just kind of the same way in Florida. Yeah, uh, like but I the people it. are really nice in both places. It's just that uh, the environment can be somewhat less nice. Yeah, but it can also be really pretty. Like Florida is a gorgeous area. It's like one of my favorite places to visit. I love the water. I love, I love snorkeling, and I don't get to do it where I live because there's no pretty clear water. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So I'm trying to think what else I want to ask about the 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 podcast because have you found that what's been happening in the podcast what the characters have been doing has um informed any of your current novellas that you've been writing for deep hollow or are you trying to keep them as separate as possible is there any other crossover happening back to the books is what i'm saying yeah kind of mostly in like the the way the lore kind of develops over time so obviously like i want to keep make sure that the lore stays consistent between the different things and i've got it fairly consistent like in my head but you know i always have to think about all right this character you know the the way that this this magic worked here i want to make sure i keep it consistent when i put it over in the books you know and and i use the books to explain things a bit more there's a little bit more there's a little bit more of a lore uh, exploration in the books than there are in the show for the most case because in the show they're always kind of they don't really care about the lore they care more about not dying all the time you know like but there's there's the kind of things that I can kind of explore a little bit more in the books and and obviously the with the books influence the show because the books came first and they kind of set the tone for how things are supposed to work and how all the the magic powers works with the different creatures and whatnot and how the magic system works. Yeah, have you thought of novelizing Thorn Thornvale itself? We have. But we also have a bunch of other plans that are more interesting than doing a novelization of a thing that already exists. Gotcha. Yeah. So for instance, like I'm planning a another book series that is based off that's a spin-off from Thornvale specifically, um, with a character that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, but there there's a, a sort of spin-off I have an idea for a really fun um adult fantasy series because uh, uh Deep Hollow is YA. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have an idea for like a, a an adult uh, urban fantasy series that uh, should be a lot of fun. Awesome. If I tell you what I want to call it, anyone who's who's listened to Thornbell will immediately know which character I'm talking about. <laughs> and that would be a spoiler, wouldn't it? We can't do that. <laughs> I want to save it. I may have said it before, but I can't remember if I did. But I, I just want to like. Someday I'm going to, like, release the cover and I want to see people lose their minds because that's always entertaining. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I get that. I, I love being able to do that as a keeper myself. I, I really... Yeah. I, I can't make them cry. I can make them laugh and I can make them hate me and gasp and go, oh, my God, you know, but I've never been able to make them cry. Have you been able to make your players cry? You have. Yeah, a few oh. times. At least two or three times. They've also made me cry, so. There was a scene, I won't say what it is, but you if anyone's listened to the end of season two, you'll know what it is. Um, that I had to, like, calm down, like, before I could finish it, because I legit couldn't talk, because I was, like, on the verge of tears with what was going on in the scene. And I know they were just ruined, you know. My players were... Ooh, it was a rough, rough scene. Um, just really, really good. <laughs> But I won't say anything else because if you want to listen to it, it's it's so good. And everyone yelled at me about it. And that was also fun. They like the joke that I'm a reaction vampire. <laughs> um, 
So like I, I feed off of your your energies, whether you're whether you're happy with me or whether you're yelling at me, it it, uh, it sustains me either way. Oh, I like the I hate you series that I get from my players, mostly from Sean. Oh. It's a good day when I can get more than one out of a session. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I made I've made my players cry a couple times. I know I've made I've at least there was one time. There's a a moment in also in season two. Um, where I was like telling a bit of, of a character's backstory and I started the story. Like I hadn't even gotten to the point where like, they knew that like, as soon as I said a certain thing, um, Hannah and Andrew were like, Susanna, no. And they started, <laughs> and I was just like, Oh guys, you don't even know. I can't start. Cr I can't start crying now. I just started telling the story. And that there's, one was hard. That was hard to get through to too. It's not so so good. <laughs> And they, they they got going like real early, and I was like, guys, I haven't even started. Like, you, you got to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had a number of questions come in, so I, I think we'll address okay. them. Let's hear um, it. Mango. By the way, I wore my my yep. favorite writing shirt. Oh, you've got a writing shirt. Uh, I pay do no attention to my browsing history. <laughs> I'm a writer, not a terrorist. Yep. <laughs> I don't know if it says not a serial killer. Um, I'm, I'm a writer, not a serial killer. <laughs> not a serial killer. It's, it's pretty close. Um, yeah. So we're going straight into the writing question here with Mango Draws, who is curious All right, let's hear about. Hi, Mango. Curious about how you'll deal with writer's block. <sighs> um. So. I have um I have the usual ADHD fueled brain where if I'm not interested in it I have a really hard time getting into it or if if something else is currently making me sort of hyper fixate on something then I just don't want to do it you know like and and that's kind of the way my writer's block kind of keeps together so I'll get like super super fixated on something for a couple of weeks at a time and I'll just pour everything I have into that thing you know so when I feel like writing I write a lot. So I wrote almost my entire like last book that I'm the next book in the Deep Hollow series. Uh, I'm almost done with the first novella. So this one, the first one has three uh, novellas in it. And this one's going to have two, but they're going to be longer. So it'll be about the same length. Um, but yeah, so I just got like, I just got hit with the bug. I have to write things. And um, I had a whole bunch of people that were telling me that they were reading the book. And I was like, man, I should give them a sequel. So I started writing and I just kind of just blasted my way through it. Um, and then at this point, I had a bunch of stuff come up and, and it was just kind of stressing me out. Just some life stuff. And it's less and my brain is less interested in it now. Um, so but I'm still working on it. I'm almost done with the first one, like I said. And then um, I'll get started on the next one. And whenever I start a new project, that also helps my brain kind of focus on things but actually one of the things that's been helping me with my writer's block is i got a new program that's called dabble and it gives you you can put in when you want to be done with something like a, a date that you want to finish by and it'll give you the number of words you need to write every day and i like trying to beat it <laughs> ah. so it like it gives me it kind of gamifies it yeah. for me and and i look at it and i go i want to beat that i want to beat that so i can finish the story um but I also just have sort of a procrastination thing. So if I'm like, if I have a date when I have to finish something, my brain unlocks and lets me finish things. Did so I'll give you a wonderful example. This technically wasn't entirely my fault because of the way the class schedule worked. But my, my senior year of college, my, I want to say my first semester, but not my, my last semester, I remember being pretty chill. I think it was my first semester of senior year of college. I had three writing classes, three screenwriting classes, and we did like nothing the entire year. We were just building the story and all of the all of the classes, but not writing anything down. So it came to the end of the year, and I had to write 145 plus pages of script in two weeks. That's, I don't know if you know anything about script writing. That's a lot of pages. Like the average movie is a hundred and uh, it's about a hundred and twenty pages mm -hmm. because a, a minute of screen time equals um, uh, a page of script. So the average two-hour-long movie is one hundred and twenty pages. 
So I had to write more than the length of a movie in two weeks. And I wrote, I wrote it all in two weeks, but it was just that procrastination fueled thing that made my words like, you have a deadline, you have to finish it. My brain was like, okay. So like giving yourself a deadline, I think is one way that I really find getting out of a, a slump is really helpful. So right now I need to finish this book because I have a writer retreat that I'm going on with Hannah in two weeks, mm -hmm. less than two weeks. So now my brain is going, ah, need to write, must finish this thing so I can share it with my friend. So she's my alpha reader. She gets to read everything first and everyone else gets to be jealous. That is so good that, that you're unable to unlock deadline mode. And that was how I was living a lot, doing, you know, deadline mode for practically everything. Yeah. But I've found that when people are like, oh, that's okay. I understand if you can't make the deadline, deadline mode does Shut not up. activate <laughs> no. anymore for me. Don't do so that. No, I'm, tell I'm, me you need it now. Yeah, I'm, I'm having issues with deadline mode. It's no longer effective. And I think for people who yeah. don't have ADHD, they're, they're more forgiving of themselves if they don't meet the deadline. So that is not something that can motivate them. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this is how my weird brain works. I don't know yeah. if, if your brain works differently. I can't help you, but this is how my brain do but um but yeah i think part of the problem with with me having difficulty like finishing the book i'm on right now is that the deadline came and passed and i didn't quite manage to meet it because i got horrifically sick <laughs> the, the, the couple days that i was supposed to like finish the book and so like the deadline is passed now so my brain is like but no deadline so yeah. now i have to give it a new deadline so it'll like re-engage properly <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah dixon has said do you need me to be mean, Ciro? He says, I don't want to. I said, maybe. Um, Just I, crack I, that whip for us. I can share the usual advice that writers give about the whole writer's block thing, if that might be helpful to you, Mango Draws. There's the, other than the, the deadline one, which, you know, for non-ADHD writers is also um, a good um, option for people who are... If your brain works really well yeah. in a procrastination fueled haze, yeah. there you go. Yeah. But there's also the um, step away from it for a little while, go do something else, go put input in brain, like consume other things that will um, uh, make your imagination flourish, like read a book, watch a show, um, that kind of thing. Or um, put a, what you're working on aside and get a writing prompt and just start writing something else completely different. It might help kickstart you or give you an idea to, to put you back in. Or there's also the go back to your plot. Uh, if Because if something's not working if, with what you're writing, um, it might be an actual plot issue that's, that's causing the, yeah. block, the block. So go back to your plot. If you don't have a plot, Plot what you've already written in bullet points and then work out, you know, what might need to happen next. Or if you've got the ending in mind, work out how to get to the ending from where you currently are. That Those are other things that I think people have <laughs> advised people have given me too. <laughs> that was one thing I was about to say um, is a lot of times for me, if I get writing block, it's because my brain knows there's a problem but doesn't want to acknowledge the problem. So, like, I know that this book needs something else. And the one I'm working on right now, I'm just trying to get through. I know there may be some, I kind of want to talk with Hannah about it and talk with some of my other kind of beta readers about it to see if I can fix whatever the issue is. You don't get to know yet. But um, there's a small issue of the story that I already know about that I want to talk with somebody else about. But I'm just going to get the words on the page for now and then I can revise later and figure it out so I've got the general story down and I can move stuff around if I need to but like a lot of times when I have a problem with writing something so for instance like my fantasy series I'm, I'm working on a fantasy book right now that's called Araya which is a about a um a, a world where there's our humans and elves that are in this constant sort of war between each other and there's a battle and a, an elven girl um is wounded and left on the battlefield and a human prince comes and picks her up and takes her back because he doesn't want to watch her die um and her own people didn't pick her up and take her so he's like well i guess we'll have her because he's war weary and tired and he's just like i don't want to see this kid die 
Um, so that's that series, and I know the problem with that one is that it needs more plot. I'm aware of what it needs, and I have an idea of how to fix it. But I got to a point, and then I, I had to stop, because I'm just like, needs more plot. So now that I've realized that it needs more plot, now my brain is going, oh, I can fix it now. Now, okay, I get it now. So, like, if you're if your writer's block, a lot of time, if you're if you're blocked in the middle of something, it's quite frequently because your brain has realized without you realizing that there's something wrong. And because you're a writer and because this is your baby, you don't want to acknowledge that, which is understandable. But you have to you have to figure it out. You have to look at your story and go, is there actually something wrong here? Is that why I'm having problems with this? And then, you know, especially if you're a plotter, which I am, I don't like to, I don't pants things that are under like a thousand words. Um, I'm a plotter, not a pantser, you know, I don't fly by the seat of my pants. Uh, but but um, that different. that's what that term means. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think George R.R. R. Martin calls it a, a gardener, I think. I'm trying to remember what he said, but uh, some people say a plotter or a I, pantser is the one I find more often, but it's people who just like, just bulldoze their way through with like, I know the story, I don't need to write anything down. And oh, I'm not like that. I'm like, I don't know the story, I'm not story, like that, I have to plot I've everything out. I've got a starting point, so I'll just see where the story takes me. Just like the play to find out what happens mentality in RPGs. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah like, kind of. But, uh, but I do but, find yeah, so myself that's... having to plot a little bit too, yeah. Yeah. I have to plot a little bit, like, especially when I, we'll go back to the, the, um, the podcast. I used to plot really heavily because that's how I'm used to writing. So my first couple of like monsters, I, I had like all these different things and, and in mind and all, and I wrote down a whole bunch of stuff about what could happen if they did this and that. And then my players just inevitably do something I never could have seen coming. And they're just like, I don't know why I bother with this anymore. So I've taken to just writing down, I write down the monster stats. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I no, might yeah. write down the uh, the the countdown. <laughs> Sometimes I don't. I just yeah, let yeah. things go. Yeah, I, I've um, I have no idea what's going to happen because the players have proved they are uh, the worse than than characters in a book. Um, they have their own minds. The the players have their own minds. The characters have their own minds. I have no idea what they're going to do at any given moment, so I don't plan ahead. I've given up attempting to figure yeah. it out. <laughs> I just just start somewhere. Maybe I have a monster idea. Sometimes I have no idea what's going on, and we just see where they go, and something will happen. Either they'll do something, or I'll throw them something because they've said something. Now I have like I have like the overarching because each of our seasons has like an overarching sort of big bad evil guy or whatever. So I have, like, the overarching story that I'm kind of just keeping in mind. And every once in a while I'll be like, oh, I can throw this next element in, or I can throw that element in. And there's a lot of stuff that I, I've plotted out, you know, a long time in advance. And there's stuff that I like, like to sprinkle in when people don't know what's going on. So, like, especially season two. if you When you get to the end of season two and you find out, like, the big reveal that happens, you can go back through the season and go, oh, that's what that interaction meant. Oh, that's what that interaction meant. And like every, it just it just completely changes the way you re-listen to scenes between different characters, and it's really fun. I I need to be like that. I'm more the opposite, where I will get to the end near the end of something, and I'll be like, okay, what what is not yet tied up, and I will take mm -hmm. things that have already happened and kind of explain or sort it. This is what this has led to. So I'll I'll let what's happened in form instead of being able to plot and foreshadow but it looks like i've plotted and foreshadowed you know what i mean because hey, a talented can, dm yeah. <laughs> can, can do that you know you get through and, and you're just like yes that was definitely my plan all along correct yeah yeah Okay, we've got another question here from the real POTUS98. He asks, do you maintain right. a tome of lore or similar world building repository for your per for personal reference? Ah, wow, words, sorry. Yes. Um, so in, it did, well, not really for Thornvale. Like, I have some stuff written down that I don't, like, want to forget. But most of that I kind of hold in my head. But for Deep Hollow, I do because I, I want to make sure I'm not forgetting things. People will forgive you a lot more if you forget things week to week in a podcast than they will in a book. 
So, like, for instance, the the way cars work in our, like, we are constantly just teleporting vehicles around because I can't remember where they were the week before. And people don't really care. They'll point it out. They're going, hey, you moved that car from this place to this place. They're like, oh, yeah, you're right. And then we move on because nobody really cares. That's not a, it's not an integral part of the story. Um, but I am a lot more careful with the books because I want them to be very regimented and I really don't have any reason um, I have no excuse to to screw up story elements uh, or or make plot holes where there shouldn't be because I just can't remember what happened the week before. Um, so especially because I want to be able to describe characters as I have before, especially when I'm like going from one book to the next, you know, I realized that like, man, I really didn't describe a lot of characters in uh, in the first book. <laughs> So I'm actually working on a, a version to uh, like a second edition of the book that's going to have a different cover. I'm working with a new cover artist. Um, I like my current cover, but I, I want to be a little more market yeah, friendly, yeah. for lack of a better word. Brand. Um, Brand, yeah. I can talk about that later if people are interested. But um, but yeah, so I have like kind of a, a story book thing in my in my writing um, application that I use. It's called Dabble. Um, a, it has like I have a bunch of different tabs on it that have like uh, like different locations, little descriptions of them. So like I'll say there's this coffee house that this character likes to go to, and this is what it's called. This is what it looks like. This is what it's known for. That kind of thing. And I'll have like the character um, character biographies of different lengths, you know, depending on how important the character is. And then whenever I add something in the story, I'll go back and update. The thing so that I don't forget it you know like the first book if I remember right I changed I changed Hayden's eye color halfway through the book and then I had and someone noticed and I had to go back and fix it so now I have a little actual written down thing that has this is this character's eye color this is what their hair looks like this is what their <laughs> you know descriptions yeah so yeah I mean I you use Dab Alive. I um, shared the link already in, in earlier in the chat um box. But um I I use Scrivener, so which is mm, yeah, it good seems to be something that's somewhat similar, so yeah. Um I think we had another character. It was a, it was about Muse. But I, I I I think do you have a Muse? Do you feel like it comes yeah, in and out she's of your a bitch. Life? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like to insult my muse. He's mean. Um, so, for instance, right now, like, I was going to work on my fantasy book that I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And then my muse said, no, Deep Hollow. And I was like, but but, but I wanted to finish my fit. Nope, Deep Hollow. Oh. Well, if you're going to give me anything, I guess I will accept your inspiration and I will go do something for Deep Hollow. So I already have the entire like first like season, for lack of a better word, of Deep Hollow because I originally designed Deep Hollow to be a television show. Oh yeah. Uh, and that was the original concept in college, and then I I shared it with my like classmates for a class project, and my teacher came up to me afterwards and said, "This is really really good, um, but it's really hard to get television shows done in these days. Why don't you you should write it as a as a book series, um, and then if that gets big, then you can make it into a television show." Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I have it written out. The reason they're novellas is because they were originally designed as episodes. Mm -hmm. So they're shorter. They're meant to be shorter. So I just like, I don't feel like expanding a good story out to be more than what I already had it being. So I'm just going to make them into shorter books and sell them that way. And if people want them, they want them. And if they don't, I, I don't. Oh, well. Yeah. But I don't want to like take a story that is already concise and, and not super complicated and make it super complicated for no reason, you know. I have other longer stories I can write. Like the second of the the the, the book series that I want to write in the uh, Deep Hollow, Thornvale, Dragon Knights universe is going to be longer books. Mm. But for these, I'm just going to stick with the, the novella length because I like it. I think it's fun. Yeah, no, I, I totally love novellas as well. And, and I get that, that if you've written it that way because that was the way it needs to be written, you can't add more padding and fluff to it. You, you've just... Yeah. Yeah, that's wrong. Um, Dixon has commented, that's probably why it fits so well with Monster of the Week. You originally wrote it as a TV show. Yeah, yeah. I totally designed it originally as like a television show. Um, 
in the vein of something like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Supernatural, you know, kind of going off of, that's kind of the stuff that I like to watch anyways, mm -hmm. you know, so I always love that kind of stuff. Like I watch like, you could consider something like Warehouse 13 or Eureka to also be basically <gasps> Monster of the Week shows, sort of Artifact yeah. of the Week shows, but they're, you know, stuff like that. That's my favorite kind of stuff. And of course I love, you know, I love superpowers. So I gave all my characters superpowers and and it all just kind of expl exploded from there. It's really funny that I married a man who loves dragons, and even before that, I was making dragon-based characters. <laughs> no, obviously, you have something in common. I mean, it's always good when you've got something. Some things, more than one thing. In oh, we are the same other. human being, just in a different format. <laughs> Except I don't like peanut butter and chocolate, and he does. That's, oh. that's the only difference. Together or separate? I know, I'm a weirdo. Right. To together i like them separate i just i don't like salty and sweet things so no i get you so you don't like salty a lot of candy bars either. don't don't work for me because i don't like caramel and i don't like peanut butter and chocolate and it's just i was gonna say I, i'm I, very picky yeah well i don't like peanut butter myself so i like i like chocolate but yeah we, we have some the other only things. like salty and sweet thing i like is like i'll eat like peanut butter and apples like apples and peanut butter is really good it's a good gotcha. healthy snack there's another one you put peanut butter on celery sticks. Yeah, I just hate celery. Fair enough. I don't like it either myself. But uh, my... it just tastes like grassy water to me. And then it's fibrous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't like textures. Like like many people with ADHD, I'm I'm very averse to certain textures. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mango Jaws said they tried peanut butter on celery and it was bad. Fair enough. Best. I mean, yeah, my my to hubby, each their own. Yeah, my own, my hubby likes celery and peanut butter, so I said put it together, and he was like, "I is that a thing?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's a thing, but I'm not gonna eat it because it's two things I don't like." Mm -hmm. He tried it; it was all right, but it's effort. Just put the peanut butter on the crackers, right? Okay, S should we move into? The actual what was the, description the, yeah. writing advice. What? Sure. Tell us, Susanna, what is the the greatest, most helpful writing advice you have ever received? All right. So I initially heard this from my mom. I don't know. She claims that she might have gotten it from somewhere else, but I've never seen it anywhere else. So I'm going to say my mom came up with this. But so my greatest writing advice I've ever received was uh, put your hero up a tree and surround the bottom with alligators. And this is so great because it's a great description of so many things in in a story you know like the ba the main thing it is is about conflict mm -hmm. so it's the idea of you know find a situation that is a bad thing something your hero needs to deal with so your hero has gone up a tree and now they need to get back down it's a very simple thing but but there's more conflict there's more things that your hero has to deal with so put the alligators around the bottom and now instantly you have a much more interesting story because you have added in these extra in little bits of conflict. So if you're ever reading a scene, you know, you're thinking like, man, this is really boring. You know, you're writing something and you're like, man, this is really boring. Like, I wonder why it's probably because there's no conflict going on. That's one of the biggest problem is like, is think about where your hero is right now. Are they safe? Are they comfortable? Then we're probably bored. So like that is my favorite writing advice and I just I just love it. It's so good. I, I think the best example of that in um in media is Indiana Jones, because it seems like every two minutes he is up a different tree with some different alligators. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, another great example is like Lord of the Rings. Like bringing the ring to Mordor is already kind of an interesting story because there's obviously going to be some stuff along the way but then you keep throwing more stuff at them you throw more and more you add more alligators to make the situation more and more desperate and then the interesting thing about the story is seeing how they get out of the how they get out of the problem like how do you get out of the tree do you look across and maybe there's another tree that is a big strong sturdy branch you could run across and maybe swing yourself over tarzan style and try to get down that tree or you know maybe you call in a friend and they can come shoot your alligators for you or you pull out a you pull out a gun that only has 
you know, three bullets and there's four alligators, you know, like there's all, there's so many things that you can do, you know, but the more conflict you add into a story, the more interesting automatically the story begins. Mm -hmm. Becomes. Become. Begins. Eh, well, that's the interesting Begins part, to become. Begins yeah, gotcha. <laughs> so, how can we add conflict? I mean... Well, it depends on your story. Mm. So if you think about, one thing to think about is like, what does your character want? And now you need to stop them from getting it. Mm -hmm. So if you are talking about, um, we'll use Lord of the Rings again, because it's something everyone knows about. But say you have, um, you have a hobbit who wants to live a normal life, who is perfectly happy being where he is. Mm -hmm. And then someone comes along and disturbs his normal life and says, hey, you have that thing. We need to take it to this place. And the hobbit is like, okay, I'm not happy about this, but I'll do it because I feel like I have an obligation. So the Hobbit takes the thing to the place and you're like, okay, great. Story's over now, right? Wrong, because there are more conflicts. The Hobbit takes the thing to the place, Rivendell in this case, and realizes that, oh, it's going to be a real problem getting this thing to where it actually needs to go. And he still has this obligation, this feeling that he has to do the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So now the Hobbit has to take the thing on a massive journey. And that is going to be fraught with all sorts of problems. So now the Hobbit has the thing. I want to take the thing to this place. But we can't just let him go there. We have to keep throwing crap at him. So you've got... It, everything from there kind of explodes out. You know, like you keep throwing things at him. And, and most stories are just how to stop your character from getting what they want until the end. And once they finally get to the end, then you have the the excitement, the conclusion. Your hero finally gets out of the tree. He is safe from the alligators. And it's a momentous, exciting occasion. Uh, what I usually say for, um, you know, I'm writing books and that kind of thing is that they have the whole arc thing. And if the conflict goes up, there should be, you know, if it, a lull or a, a breather for the yeah. reader before it ratchets back up again. How do you... What kind of examples can you give of, of it coming back down before it goes back up? Well, if we're talking about the character wanting things, obviously a character doesn't just want one thing. So you can give them little things that they're allowed to have, and they can have little victories along the way, mm -hmm. you know. So little, those little victories can be moments when the, when the, when the, the reader can go... Okay, okay. Everything's not everything's not terrible all the time. If you have a story that just ratchets up, 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 people are gonna get like, man, when is this gonna when is this gonna like relax? And and you can make a story that works like that, you know, but in general you kind of wanna give your hero like little little things along the way that are little successes, you know, little things that allow them to to have a little breather, or if they literally just need a breather, like have them have something really exciting happen and then okay we get to hang out with the elves for a little while and chillax for a bit you know that kind of thing yeah does the conflict always have to be something physical oh no of course not it depends on the story you're working from so in in the again we'll use lord of the rings um, one of the conflicts is that frodo is being drawn to use the ring right so he is being he is constantly at war with his own self between what he wants to do, this this internal conflict of should I use the ring to I can use it to make my life better, but I know that that the this dark lord will be able to see what I'm doing. You know, he'll know where I am and he can send someone after me, but it could make it better. And he's got this this pull to use it, this this evil presence that wants him to use it. And you can do that in in other cases. So, you know, if you are telling a story about a um Let's use Mean Girls. Everyone knows Mean Girls, right? So what is the conflict in that movie? It's that the character is betraying who she is, right? So she's she's compromising her own morals to become someone she really doesn't want to be. That's the way a lot of teen comedies and, and dramas go. Is someone is, is compromising who they are to be something that they're not. Um, we've just had a question from Mango Drawers. Um, also, sure. Um, 
do you guys have a favorite YA book? Um, and also, how did you decide to make Deep Hollow uh, young adult versus adult fantasy? Um, I just really like YA. I like reading it. I like writing it. Um, my favorite uh, YA series growing up has, has been, I'm not going to pick a book, but my favorite series was like um, the, uh, the Percy Jackson series. I love, I love those books. That was, I could show you my copy of them. They're just falling apart. I read them so many times. I was actually, a cute little story as I was looking at them the other day because I was cataloging all my books the other day. And I noticed one of them, one of the Percy Jackson books is so old because I've had it for so long that um, it has little bite marks on it from my childhood dog when she like grabbed it and, and ran off with it at one point. So I was like, oh, that's kind of sweet. I, I remembered when that happened, you know, so... I, I love that series. And and the reason I chose to make Deep Hollow originally is just I like YA. I think it's cool. I think teenagers are, are a particular um a particularly interesting time because <laughs> oh teenagers are just so stupid. You can get away with a lot more with teenagers than you can with adults because if, if I watch like I one of the reasons I don't like a lot of like romantic comedies is they're just so dumb. They they just don't communicate. They're just terrible people. But when a teenager acts like like kind of an idiot, you know, you just look at me and go, oh, they're a teenager. <laughs> they're supposed to be stupid, you know. Like their their pre their their brain is not fully developed. We can understand why these these silly things are happening. And obviously, like not to talk down to teenagers, but like you'll understand when you're older. <laughs> but like I just I like that time of of life. I think it's I think it's cool. I think like. There's so much going on in in the life of a teenager, you know, just because your 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 brain is changing, your body is changing, everything around you is changing. People want you to do things now, you know. You have the, all of these sudden obligations and school and getting ready for college and getting a job for the first time. It's just a cool time, and I, I like exploring things around that. There's the emotions, there's hormones, there's not understanding, not fitting in, wanting to fit in, finding yeah, yourself. Yeah, there's so much. Your hero's journey is really starting here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And also as readers, they probably haven't, uh, they aren't aware as much with the tropes and the cliches. In, yeah. In books and, and other stories, so... Yeah. I try to stay away from, like, too many cliches or tropes. But, like, honestly, if you're writing something, you're going to do stuff that other people have done before. Nothing's like, I always get a little annoyed when someone is talking about, like, um, the inheritance cycle, you know, like, uh, Aragon and all those books. Because they were like, oh, he just copied Star Wars. Like, yo, Star Wars, okay, is Hero of a Thousand Faces verbatim. Like, there's no difference with that book. Like, everything copies everything else, and, and a lot, if you start looking at everything that copies basically the same thing as Star Wars, you're going to notice it all over the place. Everywhere. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just that this one particular thing people just clung on to, and it was kind of ridiculous. Because it really, it really wasn't, like, as similar as people said it was, but, you know, every, you're never going to come up with something, like, probably entirely new. Every time I think I come up with a cool idea that no one's ever done before, I find a couple of weeks later, it's like, oh, yeah, boy, someone already did that, did they? And that is not a bad thing, okay? I've had a lot of people that are saying like, oh, man, I really don't want to start like a D&D &D podcast because there's so many D&D &D podcasts out there. And I'm like, babe, but there's not yours. Yeah. However you tell your story, unless you are literally stealing from someone else's story. <laughs> You know, you're going to tell a story in a different way. Your players are going to act in a different way. Your characters are going to react in a different way because they're your characters. They're partially based off of the way that you think or the way that, that you think someone should think, you know, and that's going to influence. So I always say, like, just do it. Just have some fun. Do it. You're, you're going to come up with a different story than anyone who's ever done it before. But there are loads of tropes that you can do. Like, for instance, I might have mentioned my one of my favorite podcasts is, of course, The Adventure Zone. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite uh, arcs of that show is the time loopy one. Uh... Guess what? I used a time loopy thing in one of my stories. It's not like I stole it. I didn't steal it directly from them. But yeah, it totally influenced the reason that I wanted to put it in my story. And that's okay. Yeah, because we always bring something different to it, and as long as you do bring something different to it, um, that's, that's all you need, really. 
it's just like giving someone the same to a, a multitude of people the same prompt writing prompt and even the same characters you know the same plot even and they will still write something almost completely different because of what they bring exactly to the table. like i used to have a writing club uh, when i was in college I actually started my college's writing club and um we did writing prompts every once in a while and we would have people come with their little short stories and they would always be vastly different like, you just never know what someone is going to come up with. So, yeah, write your thing, okay? That's all I have to say. That's why we enjoy tra tabletop RPGs, too, because we never know what our players are going to come up with. Yeah, that's exciting. I get to write a thing, and I don't know where it's going. This is great. <laughs> Collaboration, man. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um. Wow. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question, but I will ask it. The real POTUS, why do pro-level stories with millions of monies still have gigantic yet easily fixed plot holes? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I can answer this question. Um, in a lot of cases, I think, honestly, just because someone was probably too close to it, you know? A lot of times, like, you can write stuff, like, and n nobody will tell you no, and the farther up you get, you know, the far in the food chain, the less people are willing to tell you no, mm. you know? So I think that's part of the reason that, that you'll find that sort of thing. But, like, plot holes aren't honestly always a big deal. Like, go back and read Harry Potter. It's full of plot holes. It's still one of the most famous things ever written and sold the most things. Because people just don't care that much in a lot of cases. Like, the time turner alone is just the biggest plot hole. <laughs> you know, like, a lot, sometimes it just doesn't matter all that much. But, like, in some cases, it can be really frustrating if it's super obvious. And, and you look back and you're just like, this would have fixed everything if you just hadn't done this thing. And sometimes it's just because people are rushing and they just want to get something out very quickly. You know, like, they have a deadline and they want to meet it and they just don't get it edited properly. Mm -hmm. Or oh, they could always. Um... But I don't have millions of monies, so yeah. I I don't have a complete opinion about this. And that's always another reason for them to release another book, right? To fix that plot hole or explain yeah. that plot hole, or it's not really a plot hole because this is what happened. Ah, yeah. buy more books with your monies. Totally. <laughs> I totally didn't screw this up. I was just setting up something for later. Yeah, which, Never said like, that before. Which we've already said is, is how I operate. I don't necessarily create plot holes, but um, I do go back and see what needs tying up and then explain why. Plot holes happens, are you know? perfectly capable of creating themselves. Oh, yeah. The yeah. <laughs> well, thing is, you're a human being. Like, plot holes will happen to everyone. You will always forget something between books, especially if you've written a lot of books. Like, it's hard to remember what you wrote before. Like, you have to go back and remember things and, and you have to reread your own stuff or you're going to forget your own stuff because you can't just, like, write everything down in your little show Bible or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, plot holes happen because we're human. We make mistakes. Yeah, We are Dick fallible creatures. Dixon just says, it's not a plot hole. It's a plot opportunity. <laughs> If anyone Plot else has any questions that's for Suzuna regarding Thornvale or writing, please feel free to pop them in the chat box. Yes, we I love talking about all of those things. Oh, my husband just turned up. He opened the door and he shut it again. So I guess he's going to find another way to get into the house. Oh. <laughs> I love the little dinosaur hiding behind your cat tree over there. Yeah, yeah th this, um, his name is Newton. Um, oh. and he's actually a doorstop, but for some reason I put him up there. Um, there's, he's cute. The, there's the cat up there, the cat plushy toy, which is Ricky's faux bro Ronnie, who he takes, drags around in the middle of the night and humps and makes noises too. <laughs> and Cats, the song gotta love people. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, we've got more comments from Dixon. How could the author forget that the mailman, who was in a single paragraph in the first book 12 years ago, had a small star on his left shoe? 
Exactly. It's stuff like that, and it's funny because people will pick up on them. If you get enough people that'll read your stuff, people will just go like, hey, what happened to this character? Or like, hey, that character said you said that their right eye was blue and their left eye was yellow and their right eye was yellow and their left eye was blue and stuff like that. Like, It's kind of funny, like um, in our Patreon show, um, which is called Planes of Fate, I have a character that has heterochromatic eyes. And I and we get lots of when we get art of this character, it's never like consistent which eye is yellow and which eye is blue. <laughs> like I think people just just like ah, uh, one of them's this color and one of them's that color. Yeah, and I can't remember half the times because it's not important. I find I don't provide that many details because on one hand I have to remember the details and on the other hand I kind of want the readers to fill in the details themselves. So if you just say one is blue and one is gold that was Chogs, um, then they will fill that detail in. Or yeah, yeah. I, I'm not very detailed with, with my characters at all. I like people yeah. to go, oh, I've been okay. trying to give more like a little bit detailed character descriptions just because um, I, I have noticed that the artists really appreciate it. Oh, We've yeah. had a lot of artists come in um, uh, and they'll, they'll be like, hey, can you give me a description of this character? You know, oh, and it's easier if we just put it like in the episode or in the book. Instead of having to like say later, it's like, oh, well, they probably look like this, you know. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to give like a fairly, a somewhat detailed explanation. Like you don't want to sit there and describe your character for a page, you know. But that's boring. unless they're really weird looking and you really need to explain. Like if you're talking about an alien, maybe you should spend a little while describing what they look like, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Like what color they are, how many appendages they might have, you know. That kind of tentacles, thing. yes or no, you know. Oh, Always gonna have tentacles of aliens. <laughs> um, I was just thinking something, and I completely forgot what it was gonna be. Oh, um, that whole one eye being blue and the other being gold, and like you've had it what that it seems to swap because you can't remember what way round it is. Going back to the plot hole, we can fix that. It's not actually the real character. It's the mirror clone. <gasps> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes you you have like you've read some you wrote something down accidentally, and you just write it, and you're like, "Hey, that's better." I'm gonna go back and fix it. Unfortunately, you can't do that between books, but you know. Well, that's the thing with with ebooks, though, is you can kind of go back, fix it up and you know well even really well honestly like you can go back and, and start like fixing things and i i mm -hmm. listen to a lot of like uh, brandon sanderson stuff and he's talked about how like yeah every once in a while we'll find a plot hole and we'll go back and fix it for like the next edition of the book and i'm just like you can do that and nobody cares like that's the thing like i've got these books and i'm gonna change the cover Mm -hmm. because I want from now on I want the books to have consistent covers and yeah. so for I want this the cover of the next book to match and um I can talk a little about it if anyone's interested I can talk about why I'm changing the cover but like um you know I if I go back through and I fix a couple of little things and you know typos because I'm an indie author and that happens I found a typo oh I found a typo in one of my one of my um uh, let me find it real quick. I was reading, I've been on an Agatha K uh, Christie kick recently, and I found a typo in an Agatha Christie book. Mm -hmm. It's like a professionally published typo. Where did it go? <laughs> what was it? Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know if you can read it, but it says the Yug man instead of the young man. <laughs> the question is The Yug man nodded miserably. Is it? It meant young, it says the Yug man. And that is a book that has been around since the 60s and has oh, been through so many like, different publishers and someone still screwed it up. Well, that's the problem. The, the question, though, is it is it something that's been introduced when they published it or is it been um, it's there from the original publication? Because that will be interesting to see. I have no idea. That, because yeah. once something goes into I only have one copy domain, of the book. right? All you've got to do is copy and paste. Um, I don't think Agatha, uh, most Agatha Christie books I don't think are in public domain. Oh, okay. Well, it depends. She has some books from the 20s and some books from the 60s. So the older books are not, but the young the younger books are. So, yeah, because I think public domain um is 
actually I'm not sure. They might, might not be. I think it's 70 years plus the li plus the the well, life of the author. The depends. author's life plus 70 years. So she it died. Depends on when that copyright law seven? came into effect. Because if there was 70s? anything before yeah. then that act came into effect, then it doesn't apply, I believe. No, it does. Um, they did it because the reason that it is the way it is in the U.S. is because Disney, Disney wanted to have Mickey Mouse for longer. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because the 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 the, the ridiculousness that is Mickey Mouse or the Disney Corporation interfered in in the U.S. copyright law. It used to be more lenient than that. I think it used to be just like fifty years or seventy years or something like ninety years something like that. But now it's. I think it's seventy. It's it's the author's life plus seventy years. So some so some of her books might be, I think. I'm very bad at math, also. So I know there's a, a number of um, old TV shows that are currently in um, public domain because I think mm -hmm. there was something that required them to be registered or licensed within a, a certain amount of time. Because Beverly Hillbillies earlier seasons are available in public domain at the moment oh interesting yeah it's, yeah it's really weird i was like i've had no idea this is weird but yeah um dixon's just pointed out that the kindle app lets you submit typos and they might get updated corrected and auto downloaded to every copy that's been downloaded huh i've never heard of this I do know um, that if um someone... i would hope they would tell the author about that yes, but i, when, when I don't something... know if the if something's been reported, then you... I don't know if they notify the author, but the author should see that there's something when they log in that will let mm. them know, and then you can change it. Yeah, I don't it. know. I've never gotten that. I've um, never... No one's ever told me there was a typo. I've had people tell me that there are typos, but it's usually like, hey, I'm reading your book. There's a typo. Yeah. I'm like, oh, sweet. Thanks. I'll yeah. fix it eventually. Actually, a funny thing happened. There was a problem with the formatting um, in this book. There's no chapter one. Okay. There's no chapter one. And then chapter 10, the formatting got janky of the last book. Um, let me find it. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Okay. So if you can see um, mm. where it says chapter 10. Uh, right. Move it up and down. Down here. Yeah. So normally the formatting looks like that. Oh, so it didn't, <laughs> so, didn't start on a new page or anything. Wow. That yeah, no, no, it got all janky, so that happens. But nobody cared. I think my friend that was reading, I was like, hey, you know your formatting's janky. I was like, oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> but, like, it's not the kind of thing that people are going to care about, especially because it's literally the last chapter of this book. So if you've gotten this far and you're going to get mad about the formatting being janky on the chapter 10 title, like, I don't know what to say for you. Like, I fixed it. <laughs> but all the copies of this book that I have are these are the funky ones because mm. I bought them right after I made them. So, yeah, yeah. Proof, proof copies, people. Sometimes they yeah. aren't accurate. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions here for Susanna for regarding her podcast, Thornvale, the Monster of the Week podcast, or anything to do with writing or her books? We've been, um, I, I really did like the whole conflict thing that you did talk about. Um, in, in an essence, like when you're writing a book, this, this is probably the best time to end a chapter. Is it a cliffhanger, which could be the just the almost at the peak of the conflict, you, you know, in order to get them to turn the page to keep reading the next chapter to find out how it's resolved. That's one way to do that. Or if you're, I do love my cliffhangers. Yeah, people say they hate reading cliffhangers, but it works to get them to, you know, keep turning that page or to buy the next yeah. book kind of thing. Tell you what, I have like. As a, like I said, like I'm a reaction vampire, so I live for people's reactions in whatever format. But like, as a reader, you know, I have all the same emotions that normal readers have. So, you know, like when it's me, you know, I'm like, okay, so, so they, um, so, you know, their, their, their parents died and then their house was set on fire and, you know, that kind of thing. And then when I'm a reader, it's like, no, don't hurt my baby character. I love that one, you know, but so for instance, like I love cliffhangers. I'll put cliffhangers and everything because I love cliffhangers. I think they're so fun. And then, you know, when I'm 
when 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 I'm reading a book, I want to throw the book across the room because I'm so <laughs> mad. I can't tell you. Like I, I was talking about the Percy Jackson series earlier. Have you read the Percy Jackson series? No, I haven't. I've only seen that movie. Okay. The sequel series, um, I can't remember what it's called. It's the Roman one, whatever. Anyways, the sequel series, the book Mark of Athena, ends in the worst cliffhanger. And I bought that book the day it came out. I was so excited for it. And I read it in like a day. And then I was so angry at the end of the book, like in a good way. You know, like I was just like, how could you do this to me? I have to wait for another year or so. Why would you do this to me? You know, like I was so, anyone who's read Mark of Athena knows what I'm talking about. Just the last scene is just like, why? Why, Reardon? Why? And I, I can't tell you how much I want to throw that book across the road. I was so mad. <laughs> Mango, but it's Mango a good, but it's a good it's a you. rage of a it's a good rage you know yeah like i want to induce good rage in people like i don't want people to be mad at me because i wrote something that's like bad you know in whatever format like i want you to be mad at me because something happened in the book and it pisses you off you know like <laughs> I, I like that kind of rage yeah, yeah, I, it I makes think me happy. I think that helps the the to be a, a keeper or a DM or a GM to um, <laughs> really enjoy that kind of reaction. Um, let's see, uh, Dixon says the books are really good. Um, Mango Draws Thank says, you. "Oh no, that cliffhanger was brutal." Um, they also said he apologized for the cliffhanger in the following book, didn't he? I don't remember, he, but he might have. I just remember just like, I must, I need this book right now. And I got it like immediately after it came out. And I was just like, I gotta know what happened, man. You know, like, I was just immediately tearing the book open. And was just like, nobody bother me for the next like four hours. You know, immediately yeah. had to know what happened. Um, it was Dixon, so brutal. <laughs> Dixon asks, have you considered um, having a comic made of either your book or Fawn Vale or possibly a future project? I have a really good idea for a comic series. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is I can't write or I can't draw. Yeah. So I need if if somebody someday if I can some some someday like get uh, find someone who does that kind of artwork. You know, if I can find like a good comic artist, I can do it in the way that I want to do it, and maybe I can do like a fundraiser or whatever to like get it made. You know, comics are hard to make. You know, mm -hmm. but um, and they don't sell for a lot and they're hard to put out there but i have a really good idea for a comic series um but i just can't do it because i don't have the skills necessary for it or the time to find anyone but i have lots of ideas for that sort of thing a lot of the things that i want to do are things that's just like yes i want to do it but i don't have the skills or time to do that thing you know and also, it costs money too to find to get the people who do have the. Skills. Yes, art is expensive. Mm -hmm. I would know. I'm working on getting two, uh, two new covers right now. <laughs> and it should be. It's it's a yeah. a wonderful thing that people are able to do. You know, like I'm always. I remember the. I remember one time I was just like. Uh, I was going on a screed on like uh, Twitter. Someone's like, everyone should pay their artists. And then I was sitting there and I was like, did I pay my artist? For the mm. last thing. And I had to like message my artist like, hey, did I pay you? He was like, not yet. I was like, I should pay you. And so <laughs> I went and I paid my artist. <laughs> it's funny how it works sometimes, you know. Yeah. But like on purpose, I always try to like pay my artist as much as I can afford to, you know. And what I would really eventually like to do is like have more money from the things that I make so that I can pay people more money, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I... I would like to... I've, I've been thinking of maybe when the second book comes out doing like a Kickstarter or something for it um, to maybe um, be able to pay some people more, you know. So just because yeah. I, I like the idea of like paying my artist, I'd at least like to be able to make back what I paid my artist because books, books, art's expensive, but it's yeah. important. Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, we want to get paid for our books, and they want to get paid for their art, so you've got to be fair. Yeah. I do art, too, I guess. Well, I, I guess I, the I do art in a yeah. variety of ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, My whole family is kind of... Uh, 
artsy in a variety of ways except for my mom so my mom is the writing uh person but she does like sort of like very academic you know and technical writing and she's great at finding all the typos but not necessarily at the story structure type stuff Mm -hmm. so she's my she's my like she's my first like content editor my first uh proofreader yeah yeah uh dixon says to check with people in the discord servers there are a lot of artists that might be interested Mm -hmm. Mm yeah i have um the artist i have right now was someone um uh hannah my uh my player introduced me to whose name is also hannah which is funny the artist um yeah she does really good art and and, um hannah had won a contest of hers to have one of her characters made and then um we then um had uh all of our planes of fate characters made so if you go to like our twitter page and you see like our banner at the top all the planes of fate characters in the banner are made by that person and she's so good so she's doing my new um deep hollow covers and the original deep hollow covers were made by the same artist that does our um our podcast uh art and uh i guess i can talk about that if you'd like sure so the reason i ended up um fixing them is just because um I am in the YA genre, and these covers really don't scream YA. It the, the the more cartoony style kind of says this is more like a middle grade thing. But that is not what I want to have them screaming. So I'm getting a a different kind of cover that is a more sort of photorealistic, which is more of a YA right now. Is kind of that's what that that's what people look for when they're looking for YA. So I want my books to look like YA books. So that people are more interested in buying them. It's not that the cover is bad. And obviously, like, I have no interest in changing the cover for the podcast. Because the that that sort of cartoony style really works for a podcast cover. Yeah. Like, a lot of podcast covers have that sort of cartoony style. So it totally works for what I'm looking for there. But for a book cover, you kind of have to, like, look at all of the different... Um, different covers in your genre. If you're So if you're writing in YA... Writing in YA fantasy, urban fantasy, the more directly you can like pare it down, the better people are going to want to do. Because the old adage of don't judge a book by its cover, people do that all the time. It's it's bull, it's bull crap, okay? It's correct about people. Don't look at a person and judge them, you know? But like, yes, judge books by their covers. That is literally the point of a cover is so that you can judge it and decide if you want it. So, you know, as much as I love this cover of this book, I think it's cool. I want to have something that is more uh, marketable. And so for my next book, I'm kind of re-soft launching the series, basically. So I'm going to have new covers for the first one, a, a, an updated second edition with some more descriptions and some um, bug fixes, you know, mm. uh, typo errors and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Chapter 10. And then... Um, <laughs> Yeah, chapter ten, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then a fix of and then and then the new book, which will have the same cover in a more specifically like edited and, and more kind of I'm trying to take it more seriously and I've learned a lot about writing and marketing in the last couple of years, so I'm using all of that knowledge to help me yeah. uh with this new cover. Yeah. Um, we have another question. From Mango Draw. Okay. Was there ever a problem with balancing role play with mechanics? Um, not for me. Um, I think the the way, especially with the with Powered by the Apocalypse systems, I think they are very narrative focused, anyways. Mm. You know, so um, I've talked about this on on some other shows, like the the way that. Thornvale works is a little different from the way that most Monsters of the Week works because I had I was going into it with a very specific magic set. You know, like a very specific way that the magic system works, so I had to sort of tweak a little bit with how the, the magic works in Thornvale. But honestly, Monsters of the Week is such an open system, it's easy enough to do that. Mm-hmm. You know? So, I, I don't find it particularly difficult. It's just like, I kind of have a philosophy of just like, let the characters do as much as they can without rolling. And then if something comes up that that is some kind of uh, conflict that makes sense, have them roll it, you know? They're fighting something, if they're having a conversation and they need to change something, 
Um, but it's one thing is when, when you're a new DM, you kind of want people to roll for everything. And if I remember right, this was something that um, uh, Rev from the Crit Show, he's the keeper of the Crit Show, um, which is another really massive mm-hmm. Monster of the Week show. Uh, before we launched, I had reached out to Rev and, and I said like, hey, is, is there any chance um, you can give me some advice before my show goes live? And he, he said like, um, yeah, well, I've got some time. Why don't you get on me with Skype and we can talk? And I was like, oh, great. And like, uh, he didn't know me at all. He was just like, yeah, sure, I can help you out. And I was like, great, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm happy I've actually been able to do that with some other um, creators as they come along. So mm-hmm. passing down my uh, my knowledge as I go along. And um, he, one of the things I think that he taught me was that you don't have to make them roll for everything. You know, like they shouldn't be rolling for everything. If they can do something and it's really not very hard, don't bother making them roll. But roll when it's interesting. You know, if you're in a, if you're in a, a dark room, you know, if you walk into a dark room and there's a light switch and you can just hit the light switch, you don't have to make them roll for the light switch, right? But if you're in a dark room and there's a light switch and they want to hit the light switch without hitting the monster that's on the wall, then you have them roll. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's stuff like that. It's just using the mechanics in a way that is the most narratively interesting. You know, like, I, I've always joked that I can reliably expect Hannah to fail when it's the most narratively interesting. <laughs> Anyone who's listened to uh, some of our arcs, um, y- you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question from Mango Draws is, do you ever get nervous while doing roleplay? Not anymore. Not really. Unless I'm, um, I get a little nervous if I'm, like, if I don't know a group yet, you know, and I don't know, like, what their style of stuff is, and I don't know what jokes I can tell yet, you know. Um, I'm a little more reserved, I think, but I'm, I'm a pretty good role player if I can kind of pat myself, ah, my back's really sore. I, I did a bunch of, uh, weed pulling yesterday. Um, but if I can kind of pat myself on the back, I'm a, I'm a pretty good role player, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly confident in my ability to role play things. Mm-hmm. So it's really just kind of like, if I'm in a new group, I kind of have to get a handle on everyone's talent and, and how they role play and. But honestly, like, I don't really get nervous about role-playing anymore unless there's something new. You know, so for instance, there's a character, um, there's a character in season two of Thornvale, uh, towards the end, um, that had a very specific accent. And I wanted to have this very specific accent. And I spent literally weeks walking around my house. I think I've, you've heard this before because yeah, you're on with another this. podcast. Yep. <laughs> um, I spent literal weeks like walking around my house talking in this character's accent to myself so that I could get it right and by the time we finally like sat down to do it you know like I was super nervous because I really really wanted to get this accent right and I always, I always get a little nervous when I'm trying out a new accent but once I kind of got going a little bit it was okay but it was just like just because I really wanted to do that thing and I wanted to get the accent right but I don't really get nervous role playing anymore just because I've done it so much I we have over we have 170 plus episodes of Thornvale and a ton of bonus content. You know we've got like probably 150 episodes of of stuff. It's probably more than that. It's probably like closer to 200. So that's 200 plus hours of role playing. You know you kind of get used to it after a while. Yeah, I find it personally um, the only time I really get nervous is when it's on stream. And it's more mm, the yeah. leading up. It's more, not really nervous, it's more anxious. Because it's like, Because ah. mm-hmm. um, the first time we streamed a one-shot and I was a player, I, I was the leg jiggling. It was, I was all hopped up beforehand. But once you get into it and you can lose yourself in it, it's fine. I always, yeah, but yeah. I still find people having to look at me is is when I'm like, hmm. So that's why when I'm a player, I do a lot less voices. But when I'm a, a keeper and I'm able to not look at the screen, I can do more voices. It's the same with in real life mm-hmm. as well. It's like I, I can't look at people <laughs> when I'm running a game. It's so much easier to do a recording without having to look at people. 
Because mm-hmm. you just yeah, you, and you don't remember the there even. You're just in the character or whatever. Yeah. Sometimes if I'm like trying to like really focus on like an accent or something, like I'll kind of like zone out and like not pay attention to the person. Like I may be actually looking at them, but my brain is just not there anymore. Yep. No, I'm just I like I am. I am wherever this is in the world. So, like, I am in, you know, like, if I'm playing a character in space, I am in space. And I'm being this character, and I just don't know anything else that's going on. And just respond as it has to be, just so, just so like, I can make it right. But I have a very, very active imagination, so that may not work for everyone. <laughs> well, I mean, you're a writer, and you're a, you're a keeper on a podcast. And kind of a, a job prerequisite, yeah. really. Comes in handy. <laughs> What I find interesting, though, is, like, as a keeper, I may not feel like I'm in the world with them, and I'm just describing things, and I'm like, I'm just describing things. That's my mindset. But the players are like, holy shit, Sarah, this is really dark, or something, and I'm like, what? And they're like, this is really scary. This is this is too scary sir and i'm like i'm literally just thinking but i'm just describing words i don't know how this yeah. is and i'm like well maybe because it's daytime for me but they're sitting alone at night in front of their computers that the words i'm saying has really much more of a they're more into it and i'm like but it's just i'm just saying words i don't understand how it's it's yeah. a lot it's it's kind of a control thing it's one of the reasons like i don't love like um like i run a horror show right yeah. like i my my show is very it can be kind of scary in certain places um but like and i can write horror with no problem but i'm really not a fan of like seeing it and i think yeah. it's kind of like a control thing like if i'm writing the horror if i'm being the keeper like i am in control of where the story goes yeah. so i know that i can tell these stories and whether it freaks you out or not that doesn't matter because it's not freaking me out you know like you're supposed to be freaked out you're the audience you know so but like it it doesn't bother me as much because like i know where the story is going so regardless of this it's like it's not going to it's not going to like affect me as much as it's going to affect like my players or my audience gotcha gotcha Dixon has said no comment and laughing, but I'm not sure what he's no commenting about. <laughs> Do I Might have been me Dixon? saying that I can reliably uh, expect Hannah to fail when it's narratively interesting. Could be, could be. Or, or apparently I scare him. Uh, considering <laughs> he listens while he's at work, while he's welding, I mean, I guess that... Uh, that with, could be it with too. With the voice and the ears, I mean, that's got to be even more... Scary is just literally that's just you're hearing me talking about something. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're sitting there in like a dark room and it's just like, oh boy, this is a little freaky. Ah. <laughs> Dixon says no, it's because I'm that guy that messaged her directly about that one arc. Yes, we okay. We have an arc in in Thornville. We always warn people about it. It's our fifth or sixth. I care. I think it's our sixth arc, and it is a lot. Um, it's a lot, and it's it's scary. It's quite scary, and it's it's one of those things that like we always warn people. It's like, hey, look, this arc's a lot. If you need to skip it, there's a whole episode that we have that that kind of goes over what happened in it. It's okay. You can skip it if you want to, you know, but like it's, and it's a long arc too. It's like 10 episodes long or so. It's like really long compared to most of our arcs, but yeah, it's, oh, but it's one of our most fun. Like it was, it was when people listen to it, they're like, is anyone enjoying this? Like, did your players like have fun because they think they're really scared and they probably were really scared, but like in a good way. And they're like, no, you don't understand. They have been begging me to do something like this ever since. <laughs> but it was so dark and so scary that it's one of those arcs that is just like we understand if this is a bit much and you are totally welcome to just skip this one because basically there's an episode afterwards that will explain everything that happened well he says he was not warned <laughs> oh some people don't tell us when they start the arc but yeah it's um it's a lot there is a there's like a verbal like trigger warning I think at the beginning of those episodes that say hey these are a lot and like pay attention to the content warnings mm-hmm. in these episodes 
And we don't normally put a ton of content warnings on things because it's a horror show. Mm. You expect blood, you know. But if we have more sensitive topics, we like to keep them in there because I don't want to. I don't want to hurt people, you know. So, but yeah, that one was that that one arc is it's it's the arc that of all of them worries me the most because it's just like it's such a departure from the especially the arc before is kind of funny. So it goes from like <laughs> kind of funny to like super serious, which I did on purpose because I wanted to give my character things have been kind of tense until then. And so I wanted to give my characters like a little break before I gave them something super horrible. It didn't occur to me at all that the audience would go like, dang, that was some whiplash from funny sort of whimsical story <laughs> to, oh my God, this is so dark. <laughs> so, but the care the players loved it. So mm -hmm. sometimes you got to focus on that. And that's who we're primarily running these for is the players and the audience yeah. second. Um, yeah, if my players weren't having a good time, like, I think I would I would have a problem with that. Because, like, if they're not having a good time, the audience probably won't be having a good time either. But, you know, my players always enjoy it. And I, I like to, I check in with my players a lot. Because, like, I think having trust in, like, a player-GM relationship is really important. That's the kind of arc, and there's been some stuff that's happened, like, I wouldn't do with just any group, you know? Like, I have some things happen that I only do because I know these people trust me, and they know that I'm going to take care of them, and, you know, like, even if I kill their character, like, it's not malicious, you know? Like, if I was with a brand new group, like, there are some things that I wouldn't do because I just don't know if they're okay with that sort of thing. But I talk to these people a lot, and I and they trust me, and, and I trust them, you know, and that's super important in a player GM relationship because as much as I like to joke about, you know, wanting to kill their characters and, uh, and being a mean GM, like I really do once want, I want what's best for the story mm. and all of them want what's best for the story, you know, but it may not be what's best for the characters. Yeah. No, I, I totally understand. I'm finding that, um, I'm, there's a challenge happening in the, um, on the Twitch stream, basically, if people would like me to run a mini RPG campaign, uh, the information on on how to say yes is in the chat box at the moment. But I'm finding that I am um, because it's going to be on stream, and I'll probably be running it for some people that I don't know as well. I'm finding that I'm approaching it a, a little bit more cautiously, and I'm thinking about because. I don't usually use safety tools because of no mm -hmm. how well I usually know the people I'm playing with. So I'm thinking like, yeah. okay, I'm going to have to incorporate some safety tools. We're actually going to have to do a proper session zero. And I'm doing this on the one hand to be good for the players and also on the other hand to make sure it is good for the audience as well for the whole yeah. the whole story. So... I, and I don't usually do that, so th I'm just finding myself being more thoughtful and more cautious uh, approaching this. So it's it is interesting. To we're the same way. Like we don't, we never really use that. Kind of, like I didn't even know about that kind of stuff when no, I, we were like that, getting yeah. started. But you know, they were my friends. So when we've gotten to know each other more over time, so like I know where their limits are. Like I know what would bother them. You know, hmm. but. And they don't have very many because, you know, they're all writers, too, for the most part. So mm -hmm. they kind of know where the story needs to go. But, like, whenever we have guests, I'll always reach out and say, like, hey, are there any things I should know about? Um, anything you don't want to have included? Because um, I don't want to bring stuff up that would bother you. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And people will say, like, oh, yeah, here's a couple of things I don't want to bother. It's not normally something I, I would want to include anyways. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Usually the things that people don't want to have in the story are things that are awful and I wouldn't put in the story anyways. But like, you know, if there's something that's that's a little bit on on the 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 I might include it side, but people don't want to talk about it, you know, then I would be fine with with not including something like that. But it's it's never really been like an issue. Mm. But it's always something that I want to do to make sure to like reach out to people and make sure like, hey, I don't know you like super well, you know, but I like your stuff and I want to include you in my story, you know, like um so whenever we have guests i always make sure to like reach out and make sure if there's there's something i'm not missing from them because i don't want i don't want to have to like stop and rewind and, and do stuff and i don't like that so i just want to know ahead of time stuff i shouldn't talk about because i don't want to i don't want to move around stuff 
I mean, I've only the done less it. editing I have to do, the better. Yeah, yeah. I've only, I've only done that once. Retconned once, I think, for Red Getting Wolf, and that was because yeah, we have to. I'm one decided to eat a chihuahua. Um, and I was like, uh, I came back to it and I was like, no, I'm not comfortable with that. Can we re-record oh. from there on, please? <laughs> yeah. We've had, uh, we had one moment in Planes of Fate and one in Thornvale where we're just like, we finished the scene and we are like, that didn't feel right. I don't think, it's normally like, is it out of character for the character? Because if a character does something that's buck wild, you know, or like wrong, like, definitely not something you know that is like morally correct or whatever like that's not what i care about it's like would your character in their current mindset do this you know or would this other character in their current mindset do that and if that's wrong that's when we change things because it's out of character and it doesn't work mm. and it was just something you thought of at the time you know um so we've we've had one moment in thornvale and one in planes of fate that we had to fix um and then it's not hard to just redo the scene, you know? Yeah. It's not it's not a big deal. It's pretty easy to just cut one scene from one place and put it in another place. Which is what we did, you know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, so. Um, thank you to Dixon for um, contributing some Kiwi coins to unlock the mini campaign challenge. Ooh. Uh, that's exciting. Yeah. Um. Just for those who are interested in the mini campaign, uh, I've already booked Sean for it, so... <laughs> <laughs> One day I'll... Is Sean your chaos more. player? Um, not really. He's the one I can count on to... We just like to pick on each other. Um, the okay, chaos that's player fun. is Celeste, I think, and the most okay. chaotic guest, guest we've had was, was Ollie. But yeah. yeah, usually, um, usually it's Hannah or me. <laughs> like if if and depending on which one of us is like actually running it. So if like if I'm running the campaign, it's usually Hannah. If she's running it, it's usually me. If we're both in something together, we kind of like a uh, like trade off on who's the chaos player. <laughs> it is good. Usually one of us will be a little one, crazier though. than than someone but, else. Yeah. You always need a chaos player just because you know, oh and, yeah, things, chaos players are the best more interesting and you're gonna be on your toes a little bit more it's it's good for the improvising and and riffing and stuff like that but yeah. like dixon no, that's my favorite thing about tabletop rpgs is just getting to like improvise the story as it comes along yeah. you know yeah yeah yeah. dixon said you know what you're getting with sean <laughs> there you go <laughs> pretty much yeah pretty much and one day i'll let him play an evil character but um yeah <laughs> I'd love to do like um well I guess I kind of did actually I was about to say like I'd love to do like an evil um like one shot or something and I was like well that's not correct because I kind of did it's just that not everyone got the assignment um <laughs> uh, so my favorite of our one shots I think is West Weird which mm -hmm. is a western uh, a weird west game mm -hmm. where you are it's set in the uh, American West and it's like you know kind of a western type thing but it's it's got like monsters and stuff but um, the premise of the game was it's Suicide Squad, but in the Weird West. Mm -hmm. And not everyone quite got the idea that they were supposed to make bad characters. <laughs> oh. My husband was the one that like got the best because his character is awesome. He was this like serial killer crazy guy who like talks to his knives and oh, he was so fun. And like, they, cause they were all like starting in a jail and there had to be like a reason for them to be in the jail. And you know, like, oh, it was so fun. I love West Weird, but not all of them were quite, quite got the idea that they were supposed to be criminals. Well, that makes it interesting though, doesn't it? Cause you've, you've, you've got the obvious, he was obviously playing the chaos character. He might not have been the chaos player, but then you could have someone yeah. that, that has a character that's more good aligned, but then the player could be like, actually but what if we did this? this yeah so in hannah's case what if i touched something i'm not supposed to touch there's always that player listen to season two <laughs> you'll understand what i'm talking about we've had a running joke about hannah touching things that she's not supposed to touch in, in season two and, and things just going horrifically awry because of it like i had to i literally had to rewrite the the entire arc my plans for the entire arc of one arc 
in 15 minutes in between episodes because Hannah just had to touch something. And it is one of my favorite arcs. It is a fantastic (laughs) arc, and it was just buck wild, but so much fun. It's another example of of not, you know, not planning too much in advance because of characters and players. Your players will ruin your plans. If you're going to try to, if if you try to, like, force them to do it, then you're just railroading them. Like, Mm. just let the train not be on the rails, except that you don't have a, you're not running a rail. You're not running, what is this, a rail car? What's the train? train? I just said it as a good You are not running a train as a GM. This is not something that is going to a, de- a, a destination. You are running a dune buggy. It can go wherever it wants. Just let it. More like a Zorb, and it doesn't always have to go downhill. Um, for those who yeah. know what a Zorb is, this is a giant balloon thing you roll around in. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Usually downhill, but, you know... Is it like could... a human hamster wheel? Yeah, essentially human hamster okay, wheel. Okay, okay. I don't know how to name. But inflatable. Well, I only called them a Zorb because I know there's a place in New Zealand that called them a Zorb, so I don't know what they're okay, gotcha. really called. That could just be what they called it. I guess it's an orb with a Z in front of it, because Z is cool sounding, right? <laughs> right, because we're cause, all in the early 2000s. Or, or we're in New Zealand, so it could be the Z from New Zealand in the front. That may, I guess that makes sense now. I've explained the, their their brand. Um, <laughs> all right, right, right. Well, I've had a lot of fun, but um, I think it's it's time we, we brought this interview discussion chat thing to a, a all conclusion. Right. Um, unfortunately, but I would like to eat lunch soon. Um, food is important. <laughs> yeah, food is, I haven't eaten yet. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the stream and chatting with me and answering the questions that I had and also the audience had. So thank you very much, Susanna. Absolutely. Um, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me, you can find uh, Thornville at, pardon me, thornvillepodcast.com. Um, that is where all of, you'll find all of our links and whatnot. Uh, you can just search Thornvale, like, anywhere and you can find it. It's T-O-H-R, nope, T-H-O-R-N-V-A-L-E, Thornvale. I can't, I can't spell things well when I have my eyes open. Um, find that anywhere. I am Keeper Susanna on, um, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can find Thornvale on Twitter as well. You can just search it. You'll find us anywhere. Um, and, uh, on Thornvale, you can also find the link to our book in the, into my book and like the support us page. But if you search, uh, Susanna Lewis Deep Hollow, you'll find my book as well. I would say, honestly, quite honestly, I'd say wait for a couple of months because I'm going to have a new cover for it sometime next year. Unless you really like this cover, then you can have it because it's <laughs> going to be gone soon. Fair enough. And also, um, you're a dice maker, so I've reshared the dice link. Oh, yeah. Link yeah, you've you well. got my, my dice business. I make lots of pretty shinies. Yeah. Pretty clicky clacks. Clicky clacks? Click clacks. Click clacks. Yes, they yeah. make the goblin Click-clack. brain happy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And for everyone who is interested in doing NaNoWriMo, I've put the link up there for that, which is the National yep. Novel Writing Month. A writing challenge. Someday I'll finish a nano. I always have some crisis that happens in the middle of November that I'm never able to finish. My well, book I time. mean, the idea is is that you get started, and if you've at yeah. least gotten that far, you have started. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm probably going to be starting my next, um, the next of the uh, novellas for the second DiPaolo book uh, in November. I'm I'm hoping to have that done by January. I think that's kind of my goal. So I'll have both of them done and then I can get started on the editing and figuring out what the heck to call it. <laughs> so I'm probably going to rename this one too, instead of calling it Deep Hollow Novellas 1 through 3, which is a terrible name. I'm probably just going to call it Welcome to Deep Hollow oh, and nice. then put uh, and other novellas on it. <laughs> just because that's another like search engine optimization thing you know oh yes definitely marketing i hate it you're a deep hollow fan if you end up reading the book i have a um a discord just for the deep hollow series now um 
So, yeah. Just send me a message. I'll send you a link. Thank you, everyone in chat, especially to those who have said hi and asked questions. The real POTUS98, Dixon, uh, Mango Draws, also Rainy Janie, who was in here earlier. Um, if there was anyone else, I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, but thank you for joining. If you haven't already, please follow um, and you'll get notifications of when we go live. So thank you again, Susanna. Now we have Thanks for to... having me on. I had a blast. I'm so glad. Now we have to wave awkwardly while I um awkwardly bye while I find the right button to push. Bye everyone. Thank you. Oh, that's more creepy than awkward, but sure. Thank you. <laughs> I decided to be creepy. Okay. Bye.